We welcome the thousands of educators and experts in higher education who are joining us today from over 120 countries across the globe. We have over 700 universities and colleges, and we are so happy to be part of this diverse program where we have over 100 speakers who are leading the future of higher education. We invite you to share comments in the chat window because we'll be there too. My name is Renee Patton. I'm the Global Director of Education at Cisco. At Cisco, we believe in empowering an inclusive future for all and an inclusive recovery for all from the pandemic. As we move into the future, we know that technology is going to be critical to bringing learning to students wherever they might be. But what's more important than technology is you. You've been through so much this past year, and we're committed to doing whatever we can to be there for you and to continue to be there for you in the future. So whether it's by providing the technology that you need, the new tools and resources to make delivering hybrid learning easier for you, new tools and resources for collaborative research, or just to be there with you if you need someone to brainstorm to understand and talk about the future of education, we're there for you. To, to celebrate and to inspire you, we've brought you a leading voice in education, and we are so excited. It's such a pleasure to introduce you to Anya Kamenetz. And Anya is the education and education correspondent for NPR and the author of many leading books, including Generation Debt and DIYU, one of my favorites. Anya and I spoke beforehand about how we have a crucial job in education to provide support, emotional support, and, and supporting the well being of students as we move into the future. Not only students, but you, faculty, staff, and administrators in the future. So, this conversation this morning is much bigger than just technology. And we at Cisco are dedicated not only to enabling education educators with hybrid learning, but to supporting all of you as well. So Anya, thank you so much for joining us today. Renee, thank you so much for that introduction and thank you to Cisco for inviting me here. It's such a wonderful opportunity to be able to be in conversation with this community of educators at this moment in history. I feel so much respect for the work that you do and the challenges that you've been facing. My name is Anya Kamenetz and the title of my presentation today is a new reality. It feels like we've been in a long tunnel and we're finally emerging, blinking, possibly at the edge of the sunlight. And everything looks unfamiliar. It's, it's a whole new world. But I want to acknowledge that that doesn't feel the same for everyone. You know, the, the experiences that we've had over the past year of loss, of grief, of anxiety, they catch up with people at different times and they're happening to people at different times. And so what's been very helpful for me in this moment is to realize that our experiences and our reactions are really distributed along a bell curve. So some of us are really thriving in this moment. We're so excited to have vaccines and to be able to get back to normal in certain ways, to hug our loved ones, to you know go to a favorite restaurant. Um, then there are people who really are in a dark place. You know, they have hit many pandemic walls. There are things that they've lost that they can't give up on. And there's a huge number of people that are right in the middle. Um, and we have been given a name for this, that it's languishing. You know, it's, it's not really able to leave the past behind and it's not really able to embrace the future. It's kind of just in the middle. And I want to acknowledge that those of you who are listening might be anywhere along this bell curve and your students might be anywhere along this bell curve. And, you know, where you are in the academic calendar is one thing, but where your students are in terms of their energy and their ability to, to concentrate um, may be determined by factors way outside your control, right? And so just to get a little bit more into what the distinction I'm making here between struggling and languishing, I find it so helpful to name this, you know, if you are having, you know, a labeled mental health issue, something like anxiety, depression, struggling with ADHD to a crisis point, if you're engaging in self-harm or substance use, um, which could include food, it could include screen time, screens can be used as a behavioral uh, substance. Um, if you're struggling with burnout, moral injury, vicarious trauma, which is something we'll get into in a moment, this is all of what I would characterize as struggling. 
And then languishing is this gray area, right? So it has to do with things like just the loss of motivation, um, joylessness, where, where things that used to give you energy and give you life just aren't doing it anymore. Uh, generally low energy, just getting up and, and staring at your phone, not even getting out of bed, having that lack of concentration. And I mean, anyone who's a mom can probably relate to walking into a room and not remembering why you're in there. Um, so feeling like your mind is elsewhere, that can all be examples of languishing. And just to name specifically for educators over this past year, there are two issues that I want to talk about. One is the occupational hazard of vicarious trauma or secondary traumatic stress. And what this means is if you have a course load of students in crisis, or if you have colleagues that are in crisis, and your job as a professor is to be an educator, as a faculty member is to be a problem solver for people, and people are coming to you day after day with the anxiety, the job loss, the material needs that they have, the um, the the emotional needs that they have, it's very easy to have this secondary trauma. It's something we don't always name or acknowledge, but um, some of the symptoms or signs of secondary trauma, vicarious trauma, secondary traumatic stress, are emotional over-involvement with your students, feeling like you need to fix it, or it could be a distancing effect, feeling like you're behind a wall and you, you just don't want to be a part of what your students are going through, a sense of pessimism or cynicism or rage or sadness, just really intense emotions that go on. And just because it didn't happen to you and you're doing fine doesn't mean that you're not affected because we are all connected. And the very, the very similar or connected feeling that some educators are going through, another occupational hazard um, for educators is just burnout. You know, the feeling of energy depletion or exhaustion, specifically around the job, the increasing mental distance from the job, feelings of negativism or cynicism around your job, and not being able to do that job as well because of these feelings. And so, you know, I just want to name those, encourage you to seek the sources of support that are around you. You know, I think there's there's been an unfortunate tendency during the pandemic for people to say, well, it's not that bad for me. It's so much worse for other people. That doesn't mean you don't need help. It doesn't mean you don't need support. You need the support to be able to go ahead and support the people around you. And now that we are kind of experiencing that light at the end of the tunnel, acknowledging that there are those of us who are still struggling and really need to take a moment, I also think it's time to, to look ahead and face the future and think about where are we going to go from here? There are two kind of somewhat dichotomous ways to think about recovery from a disaster of this magnitude. And resilience is one that we hear so much about, and it's really, really important. And there's an emerging kind of science and study around something called post-traumatic growth. And so to take a couple minutes to, to get into those two. So resilience means bouncing back, right? And people demonstrate resilience when they go through what could be a traumatic experience, but they're not necessarily showing the signs of trauma. And there are those of us who have been able to, because of their outlook, because of the way that they are or are not personally affected by this crisis, they've really been able to go along to lean into their healthy habits or friends and family, and they're finding themselves, you know, gliding back on track. And that's wonderful. Um, so some of the components of resilience that you can seek out, especially now, if you have a little bit of time to do it, obviously rest, whatever self-care looks like for you. We know that the signs of trauma are found in the body. So things that work on the body, if it's exercise, if it's massage, if it's uh, meditation, breath work, um, these are all things that can go under the category of self-care. Anything that relaxes you, I mean, it could be golf, right? It could be getting a pedicure, um, taking care of that body. Uh, resilience uh, also means controlled exposure. So for those of us who have gotten in the habit of just mainlining the news all day long, I do it because I'm in the news, um, limiting that input, limiting that information, it's no longer perhaps as important for you to know exactly what the case load is for the pandemic everywhere in the world right now. You can perhaps limit that exposure. Um, conversely, taking a clear-eyed view. So a component of resilience that's really important is not denying what happened and not rushing forward. So understanding, hey, this wasn't the year that I wanted it to be. It, it didn't turn out the way I planned. There were things I had to give up. 
and uh, that's okay. I can I can move on from that if I acknowledge it. Um, and then also what also uh, adds to resilience is a sense of planning, improvisation, and newness. So figuring out how to approach things in a new way, in an improvisational way. Now, post-traumatic growth, which I want to distinguish, happens in a small percentage of people. So uh, it's not everyone who experiences a trauma who actually ends up in a place that is better off than they would have been before. That's a very high expectation, but it is amazing and hopeful to understand that it is a possibility. So the components of post-traumatic growth and, and some of this research that I've been uh, learning about involves a group of women who were followed um, from before Hurricane Katrina to after the C Hurricane Katrina and all the way into 2020. So this is a group of, of young mothers, very poor women from the Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans. And some of them, a percentage of them, are experiencing their lives being better off than they would have been before the storm. And the components of that are relating to others, finding new possibilities, discovering your own personal strength, um, experiencing some spiritual outlook changes, and just simply gratitude and appreciation of life. So there's actually a post-traumatic growth inventory of these factors, and it would include agree agreeing to propositions like, I develop new interests. A lot of people talk about their pandemic hobbies. I feel closer to other people. So I went through my friendships and I realized these are the people that are really standing up for um, me. Um, I can better appreciate each day. So I'm, I'm feeling that sense of gratitude just to be able to walk down the street. Maybe now I can take my mask off if that's the recommendation. Um, breathing the air, smelling the flowers, you know. Also, just being proud of yourself. You got through it. You know, you did the things that you needed to do. You got up and did it every day and you discovered perhaps a new sense of strength in yourself. So, you know, we don't know all of the factors that lead people to experience post-traumatic growth. But one of the interesting things, I was talking to someone about this and they said, do you think it could be a mindset? You know, could post-traumatic growth be a set of attitudes that you adopt? And I find that really enticing to think about that we can, we can cultivate our relationships in an intentional way. We can cultivate gratitude in an intentional way. And we can all appreciate ourselves for going through what we've been through in any way that we manage to do it. Um, so, you know, what's so fascinating about this for educators, right, is obviously for people who are in their education, whatever life point you're meeting them at, if they're young undergraduates who are teenagers or if they're older returning adults, education is a crucible of transformation in people's lives. And to be an educator at this moment in time is to see yourself as a midwife of resilience. You're able to help people with reading, with learning, with challenges, with new opportunities, with new relationships, you can help them integrate and reframe this pandemic experience. And I just find that such a profound and meaningful opportunity for each one of you that's engaged in this sacred process of transformation that we call education. And I also wanna take a moment to acknowledge that this is going on in a time of unbelievable transformation for the entire globe. Right. So the coronavirus pandemic was one of the largest global events in history. It, it, it outranks World War II in terms of the number of people that were directly and severely affected at the same moment in time in their lives. And so the question comes, can we rise to the challenge as a nation? So uh, uh, a few days ago, I was in the Muir Woods in Bohemian Grove, the ancient redwood trees. And this is the place where after World War II, there was a convention for peace, right? So there was this vision and it was in memory of, of Roosevelt who had died. And they were talking about, can we form a United Nations? Can we have a world government? Is there a way to promote peace? So nothing like this ever happens again. And I found it really moving to think about, you know, once we go through a challenge, do we have the ability to think about how we can function as a, as a global society and realizing in such a visceral way, how we're all connected? Um, and so I actually find myself turning to the works of Jonas Salk. So we all know Jonas Salk as the developer of the polio vaccine. Um, but in his later life, he was extremely committed to moral philosophy. And um, he actually published a book that I found really influential. And the title of the book is A New Reality. He wrote it with his son, Jonathan Salk. And his observation was a mathematical one. So he has this diagram in the book. And it is about... Um, the rate of change of global population. 
So this is an S curve and it marks an inflection point where we turn from having um, uh, uh, an exponential growth in population to a leveling off. And this is extremely timely because of course we, we you know, in the United States, we've just seen that we have a, um, you know, a, a drop in population, a leveling off of the birth rate. So this is happening right now. And what he took from this is that when you go from a world that is constantly growing in population to one where there is this leveling off, that there has to be a mental shift and a moral shift that takes place. Um, and, and what that is, is to say that uh, we're no longer in a period of continuous growth. So our concept of success in a capitalist society has to do with increase. It has to do with rate of change increasing and going from from two to four to six, you know, two to four to eight, right? And, and just doubling and doubling. But we can't do that anymore because we live on a finite planet. So what this means to him is that we have to figure out a new paradigm of prosperity that has to do with how we distribute the resources that we have and how we enable um, the lowering of suffering everywhere around the world. And so the contention um, of Jonas and Jonathan Salk in A New Reality in 1981 is taking care of the health and well-being of human beings in every part of the planet is now not just a matter of humanitarian spirit, but it's a matter of necessity. If we're going to survive as a species, we're going to redefine success to mean a fair and judicious distribution of resources, not only among humans, but between humans and the natural world. That's just how it has to be. And I find that incredibly moving. And we're also facing it as a global challenge right now in terms of judicious distribution, right? Where are the vaccines going to go? Who's going to get them? Um, and this is in April 2020, Jonathan Salk, the son of Jonas Salk, writing, you know, we defeated polio through a national effort to develop and test a vaccine and a global effort to make vaccinations available to everyone with no profit. And people donated money and volunteered their children for the largest field trial in public health history. Health, unlike wealth, can't be hoarded by the few. Fighting the pandemic demands replacing an us first mindset with a win-win, we together mindset. Um, so I find that really profound um, and challenging, right? I wish that the pandemic were the only major force threatening um, human society as a whole, but it absolutely is not, right? We are in a time of unbelievable promise, unbelievable danger. And um, I think Carl Sagan really captured this, um, the great uh, American scientific educator talking about, you know, technological adolescence that perhaps all intelligent life forms around the universe have gone through an inflection point where they have to decide, you know, are we going to use this incredible power at our disposal with wisdom or are we going to use it in a capricious way that um, is destructive, right? And we just saw these contradictions coming together so strongly over the past year. We saw the landing of the Mars rover, people around the world watch the Perseverance transmit images and video from a distant planet right back to the earth almost in real time. It's just absolutely incredible. Um, we're also seeing, you know, the, the tragedy of methane sinkholes blowing up in the permafrost in Russia as we see um, more and more how we're irreversibly altering the planet and the environment in which we evolved. Um, we're seeing the, you know, in the United States and then, then around the world over the past summer, the racial uprising that was caused by examples of police violence, um, where we say, how can we live together? We must learn to live together in a new way. So there are these challenges, there are these opportunities, um, there is this path of recovery, right? We're seeing potentially, you know, this huge amount of investment. The, the pandemic revealed so many of the inequities and inequalities that were already there in our society and intensified some people's pursuit of trying to recover them. So we have new policies in the United States, different places around the world, a community support of trying to eradicate poverty and um, potentially of economic growth and recovery. So where does that leave education, right? The enterprise that, that you all are engaged in, an enterprise of personal development of individuals, of economic development, of community development, this is your bailiwick. This is your wheelhouse. This is what you do, right? You're preparing people for a new world. And so 
what is the challenge back to the institution of education from what we've just gone through? You know, a year of this is my daughter, you know, doing Zoom school. Um, some of my observations about post pandemic education are that um, it potentially is post coercive, right? So what happened immediately last March is that schools had to redefine their grading policies, redefine their policies around attendance. What did it actually mean to finish out that school year? And some students, some of the best students that we have uh, looked at it and they said, I feel like uh, there's no point for this anymore because I was doing this just to get a grade and then you took away that system. Um, potentially, uh, online education doesn't have that compulsory um, aspect to it. So there's a way that uh, students feel like they don't have to do it um, because they're not in school. And then there's this unbelievable shift that happened right away where people dropped standardized testing um, as, a, as an admissions requirement. Um, and so to me, post-pandemic education includes, you know, uh, kind of recondoing of certain things that we have held on to for hundreds of years in this paradigm, having one concept of merit, having one delivery model, not having choices. And it's an embrace of the idea of bringing one's whole self to school, addressing students' social emotional needs, prioritizing these relationships, and centering social justice and equity. And so this is what I think of as education for a new reality, that we must um, pursue meaning, goals, and challenges, relationships, and personalize for each student. So what I find so compelling about this is that it's possibly the case that the very qualities that we need to cultivate in ourselves and in our students in order to recover from this crisis, in order to perhaps become even stronger after this crisis, this, these qualities like more compassion, leaning on our friends, showing up as a whole person, taking care of ourselves and the un others, expressing appreciation, showing determination, these are things that will not only serve us well in our recovery process, but perhaps be the very skills that we need to thrive in this new reality that we're all facing. But even as I think about that possibility, and I'm very optimistic about it, we also have to understand as educators and as people that people are going to be at different points in their journey. They're going to be at different points of growth. And so I think about the teachings of the spiritual leader, Ram Das, who said, when you walk through a forest, you see that each tree has been affected by different events throughout its life. Some of them are twisted and stunted, and some of them are growing straight. Some have been hit by lightning. And we don't judge them, right? Every tree, we appreciate it for exactly what it is. And what if we could turn people into trees in that way? What if we could appreciate each tree for exactly where it is, each person for exactly where they are on their journey, on their growth, as we all try to recover as a forest together? And that is my hope for education in this new reality. Thank you so much.